before we get started today, a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, we are recording. Uh, so again, it's available. If you would like a copy of the recording, we will be sending out an email at the end of today's webinar with all of the information for our guest speakers today and a link if you would like it. And also uh, make sure you guys all sign up for our newsletters for our next uh, events that are coming, including our final Ask the Expert. Um, throughout the presentation today, we're going to have um, our guests present uh, some information and then we'll open it up for Q&A. If you have a question you would like answered, I know I received some via email already and I have a whole list of questions as well. Uh, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A below. But uh, if you have a technical issue, you can't see us, you can't hear us, you just wanna say something like, Maggie, you look great today. Your, your, your lipstick is perfectly pink. Well, thank you, thank you so much. Put that in chat because we have our amazing Wendy who is monitoring our chat for all of those comments and technical issues. So uh, let's get started today with our Ask the Expert, which again is all about funeral planning, all of those fun things. We have some amazing guests today. We have Cindy, Mike, and Mercedes from Darling and Fisher Mortuaries and the Los Gatos Memorial Park here today. And I'll let them uh, tell you a little bit more about themselves. Um, and I believe that Mike and Mercedes are gonna do a short presentation before we open it up for all of their questions. So I'm gonna just say, uh, take it away. Are you guys there? <laughs> I know you're there because I talked to you earlier. There you are. <laughs> here we are. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Maggie. You appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, we're really excited to be here. Uh, I'll get my slides up in just a second, but uh, I know my video is bigger when we're talking like this. So I'll just take a true. second to introduce myself and say hi. And uh, as well as my colleagues, Mercedes and Cindy, um, there she is waving there. Um, so we're going to do a short presentation. Uh, I know, you know, we've done this before with Litherland Kennedy, um, and we're happy to be back and see some of you again. And uh, there's some new content in this presentation, so hopefully nice. I'm repeating myself too much. Um, awesome. So we'll All right. And get started. Yeah. I'm going to turn my camera off and just let you guys do it. I'll pop back on for Q&A. Sounds good. All right. Let's get started here. All right, assuming everybody can see that okay, I know we did the technology test before this, uh, please let me know in the chat if you can't, uh, but the title of today's presentation we call it Peace of Mind. Yes, we can see, oh, perfect. Um, <laughs> so today's uh, presentation is called Peace of Mind. We're talking about getting peace of mind for yourselves, your loved ones, um, everybody involved in this whole process. Um, so we always like to start it off with a little bit of trivia to get your creative juices flowing, see how much you know. It's all funeral related, so you might learn a couple of things. If you've seen this before, hopefully you remember the answer. If not, maybe it's time for some review. So we'll uh, basically we'll, we'll put up the choices here and you can put it in the chat if you think you know the answer. Um, I can't throw a piece of candy to you at prizes, but you get some bragging rights. So maybe teach your family about this stuff. So who holds the record for the world's most expensive funeral? Choices here are Michael Jackson, Elvis Presley, Princess Diana, or John F. Kennedy. Don't be shy, everyone. You have to guess something. I'm just going to make everyone guess. This we'll, is we'll really hard. You can see it. Um, yeah, so choices here are Michael Jackson, Elvis Presley, Princess Diana, John F. Kennedy. Who holds the record for the world's most expensive funeral? Princess Di. Why is it just me and Wendy? Come on, you guys. Any question? You don't be afraid just because you can see who's answering. <laughs> That's a tough one. All right, we'll do five, four, three, two, one. All right. So, correct answer is actually Princess Diana. Um, oh. Most people don't get that one. So, um, that was all Wendy. About the royal money that she had, obviously, you know, um, quite a bit there. So, $16.2 million was the price tag on her funeral and uh, still holds the record. Um, it might be beat by like Alexander the Great way long ago, but we're talking about the modern uh, times. So um, after this happened, the queen then said, anybody in the royal family who doesn't pre-plan their service is left out of the will. And you don't want to be left out of the royal will, right? So they obviously saw the importance in planning ahead there. All right, next trivia question here. Uh, what celebrity saw their funeral ticket scout for more than $10,000? Choices here are Michael Jackson, Elvis Presley, Prince, or John Lennon? If you think you know it, just go ahead and throw the answer in the chat. Uh, 
That's a tough one. I think I'm stumping people. All right. I, don't, I don't think our chat is working. So oh my gosh, okay. you're not gonna, not gonna be able to get anybody to answer. That's all right. And okay. I'm afraid to guess. I'm gonna guess Prince, but that's probably, Prince? I don't know if that's right. Okay, good guess, good guess. Let's see. Yeah, and in Q&A, absolutely. We can come yes. back to these questions later. If that's the, <laughs> we'll do it like that. All you right, can so, shout out the screen, everyone, and just you'll know if you're right or not when Mike says the answer. Yeah, loud enough. I'm not able to hear you. Um, so uh, answer here is Michael Jackson. Uh, that's a pretty big price tag for a ticket to a funeral. There was performances by Stevie Wonder and Usher, so it was more of a concert, but still pretty big uh, Price for a funeral ticket. All right, next question here. Who owns the burial plot next to Marilyn Monroe? Choices here are Joe DiMaggio, Madonna, Hugh Hefner, or John F. Kennedy. I'll give you five seconds to yell at the screen if you think you know it. I'm going with C. It just seems C. like something he would do. <laughs> Most people guess Joe. Good guess there. <clears throat> All right, correct I want answer. I to say what? Hugh Hefner. No. Oh. <laughs> So he says Hugh Hefner. Yeah, well done. It is it is Hugh Hefner. Ah, um, Maggie saw these already. <laughs> no, well, I don't remember. Obviously, I got two of the three wrong. This I know this one. That's the, maybe that's the one that just stuck out. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of the, the stump one uh, here. So well done. Um, he bought this plot back in the early 90s for 75000 And, uh, you know, obviously saw the importance in picking where he was buried. All right, next question here for Veterans Funeral Service. And if you, we have any veterans here, please let me know in the Q&A. Uh, we'd love to talk to you more about veterans benefits and those benefits that are available, what's not available, all that good stuff. Uh, but for a Veterans Funeral Service, there's a proper amount of stars that we sh should be showing on the uh, folded triangle um, on the face up side. Um, so if you think you know it, again, yell your answer to the screen. Um, I'll give you about five seconds or so. This one, I don't know if I've ever gotten the right answer on, maybe once. All right, five, four, three, two, one. I think I stumped everybody. Correct answer is four stars representing the four main branches of the military. Um, you know, there's sub branches, Coast Guard, whatnot. I kind of just get left out, but uh, that's what it's uh, meant to represent. It's really hard to actually get only four stars showing, but that is the proper way to do it. All right, so next slide here. This shows a picture of my Uncle Melvin. I always like to talk about my own story and um, you know why I got a job in the funeral business. Um, but really the, the main reason was uh, thinking back to my uncle's funeral, uh, which happened about a decade ago. He lost his battle with pancreatic cancer. Uh, nothing was planned ahead of time. He was a Freemason. He was a veteran. Uh, and both those groups are involved in funeral services. They hadn't picked out the cemetery. They hadn't picked out which funeral home they wanted. And really the, the decision-making part of all this, not only the money, but also, also the decision-making was just a huge burden on the family. After he was diagnosed, they kind of didn't want to talk about it too much. It was kind of too late. Right. And so um, I'm kind of on a mission as, as well as my colleagues to help every family uh, prearrange as much as they can ahead of time um, to make sure that that burden doesn't fall on them um, afterwards, after they're gone. Um, and that brings me to my next slide. I kind of want everybody here to just keep in mind what your most important reason. What's your reason for being here today? I know uh, working with Little and Kennedy, um, you, you're a planner, right? You plan things ahead. We're talking about relieving any kind of burden from our loved ones, um, but always keeping them in mind when we plan these services out as well. Um, a lot of people come to the funeral home uh, pre-planning their service, and they say, this is what I want for my service. And while it's great to know what you want, really the question to ask is, what does my family need at that time to begin healing? Um, so when we frame it like this, this helps us to really make sure that our family's taken care of through this whole process. All right, next slide here. This is the picture of our three main locations. Uh, we have San Jose. So these are all in the downtown areas of each city here. So San Jose, Campbell uh, is recently remodeled as well as our Los Gatos location, uh, nicknamed Chapel of the Hills. Um, and so beautifully remodeled. Uh, it's not such a depressing funeral home look anymore. It's more of like a, there's a lot of light. It's a nice event space. You know, you could 
have other events there. You could do a wedding there. I know some funeral homes around there, around the world have done, you know, weddings in their chapels. So we're certainly capable of doing that. We haven't had one yet, but uh, maybe someday, um, but beautiful event spaces and just a great place for uh, folks to gather and um, have a proper funeral service. So we've been serving the South Bay since 1931. That's more than 80 years. Um, we've been around a long time. The Fisher family is still involved all these years later and will continue to be for a long time. So we definitely take great pride in that, how long we've been around. Um, for our next slide here, this is a picture of our cemetery. I'm going to hand things over to Cindy Galvin. She's our family service counselor from Los Gatos Memorial Park. She's the expert on cemetery. Um, and so I'll let her take it away to uh, inform you all there is to know about Los Gatos Memorial Park. Thanks, Michael. It's a privilege to be here to talk about the park. It's um, one of my favorite things to do on my, mostly when I'm work, but on my time off too, I like to help people pre-plan and um, sort of like Michael, I got started in this business after losing my dad at the age of 63 in an accident. And he hadn't pre-planned because he was getting ready to retire and um, unfortunately passed away before he had a chance to. So I saw the importance after that of having things taken care of. And so I um, started my career at Los Gatos Memorial Park. Um, the park's been uh, around since 1895. It started in the downtown uh, Los Gatos area on the corner of Highway 9 in North Santa Cruz. And then um, about 1897, uh, we moved to our current location on Los Gatos Elmenden Road. Uh, the park's 33 acres. Uh, we have burial spaces for caskets and also different options for urn placement. Uh, we do have a beautiful garden called Legacy Garden, which is what the picture shows. That's mostly a cremation garden with some burial estates on the outside. Over the years, I've seen people probably trend more going towards cremation from burial. So that's why um, our company is really, um, I guess, ahead of the curve as far as having options for people. And it's a really nice place. It's a park-like setting. And we do have some famous people buried at the park. We, excuse me, we have William Hewitt. He's there. Um, he's been there for quite some time. We have some Packards and then we have an Iranian movie star that was there. Um, there uh, who was the Western star? John Wayne. That's who he was. So they had pictures of him on his hat, on his um, horse. So we are a cemetery for all faiths. We serve uh, Jewish families. We have a Vietnamese garden and um, they seem to always be developing new areas too. So that makes it nice for people that have family buried at the park and then the next generation and the generation after that. So I've seen that happen in my own personal life where you know I serve maybe the grandparents and then the parents. So um, it is really important to pre-plan like Michael's talking about it. Um, I've met with families that have pre-planned and that haven't and there's um, much more peace of mind knowing that your uh, loved ones have things taken care of. So when the time comes where they're not there to ask the question of what they wanted, they've already uh, made that decision for themselves. themselves. So I'll be happy to answer any questions too, but that's about all I have for now, I think. Perfect, thank you, Cindy. And yes, like she said, we'll definitely get to questions uh, at the end of our presentation here today. We won't take too much more of your time, um, but I wanna quickly move through these slides just kind of talking about uh, more about why pre-planning is such a, a great idea. So this slide sh here shows some of the many things that need to be taken care of. Uh, many of them you've probably taken care of with Litherland Kennedy already, um, but there can be so many decisions to make on the funeral side, as well as just all the pieces of the puzzle when, when somebody passes away. So we estimate there's anywhere from 75 to 125 different decisions, uh, documents to collect, um, you know, folks to pay, uh, at least on the funeral side, when somebody passes away. And this all has to happen very quickly, um, especially for filing death certificates, things of that nature. Uh, we want to have that information down ahead of time. So our tool for doing that, what we provide to families who come and pre-plan with us is a folder called the Final Wishes Organizer. So once it's completed, we'll have about 95% of everything done ahead of time. We obviously can't schedule your service ahead of time, but we can decide what happens at that service. Um, and so in the folder, we've got vital statistics. That's all the de death certificate stuff. And that's questions that you probably know best about yourself and maybe your children don't. If I think about my own mother, I don't know who, where her mom's mom was born. Um, I don't know how long she was in her occupation, right? So that's an answer that you can answer right off the bat and maybe whoever's left wouldn't be able to do so. So definitely important to hear it from you ahead of time rather than give that homework to the family. 
um, military information, discharge papers, we want to get that ahead of time. Um, otherwise, we got to do an emergency request for the DD-214 copy. And uh, as some of you may know, in St. Louis is where the records are for the VA, and somebody has to physically go get those and, and uh, pull those out. So it can, it can be delayed, right, uh, depending on the time of year. Um, special instructions for the family, emergency contacts, as well as contacts of people who you want to make sure get that call when the time comes. Um, going to back to my own mother, I don't know who all of her friends and colleagues are throughout life. It would take me a while to track everybody down. Um, and so having a list of at least the essential contacts, maybe people that you know would make sure that everybody else is contacted. We can leave that at the funeral home. We can leave it in the folder here and just make sure that there is no doubt these people need to be called um, upon my passing. And then finally, funeral service requests, making sure we know where the service is going to happen, uh, the religious affiliation, flowers, music, pallbearers, right? We can be as detailed as you like in planning ahead. Um, another note on that too is there's certain parts you can leave up to the family. Some people like to leave writing the obituary uh, up to the family. Sometimes that can be very healing. Uh, for our loved ones to do and so to, to write out the story of mom or dad right it's it's a can be a very impactful experience um, so we definitely want to plan as much as we, we can ahead of time so the reason that we we make plans is um, as we all know it can be difficult uh, when we lose somebody but what happens when we experience loss as human beings um, is pretty universal, we found. And so we illustrate that in what we call the acute loss period. And this is sort of our framework for planning ahead. It's something that we go over with families we sit down with and we make pre-plans for. And there's these phases of the acute loss period that we know are going to happen no matter what. As you can see at the beginning there, it says hearing, sharing, seeing. That's when we make the phone call. When we get the news of somebody's passing. We share that news with our loved ones. Um, and then, you know, we, we ask when the service is going to be. And so that part is seeing. That's, that's saying, really, when can I see my loved ones? When can we get together and gather and properly nurture our new grief? Um, so gathering, connecting, reflecting, celebrating, all of that can happen at the funeral home, the cemetery, um, you know, celebration of life afterwards, going to, going to lunch or something like that. Um, these are all parts that we need to plan for. Otherwise, it's left up to chance. We're wondering, you know, when is it, when are these things going to happen? A good example is, you know, if, if we don't have a, a proper time and place for, for grieving at the funeral home, then the news of this, this death could occur at inappropriate time and places, at kids' soccer games, at the grocery store when you run into um, a loved one. And so having a place, a time and place where we get together and have an intentional time for to properly nurture our grief is so important. Um, and that's really what we do in the pre-planning process is make sure we we do plan out a time and place for your loved ones to gather. So in the begin in sorry, in the middle there, it says begin healing. Uh, we find that that's our role at the funeral home. I think a common misconception is that we mainly focus on, on the deceased, on dead people, uh, when in reality, our main job is to help your loved ones begin healing. And that's why it's at the center of the acute loss period there. So this next slide shows uh, a study done by, or published in Time Magazine back in 1970. And what they predicted was every 10 to 20 years or so, based on about 6% annual inflation, that uh, the cost of funeral services, cemetery as well, would be doubling. So these aren't Darling Fisher and Los Casamero Park's uh, prices necessarily, but it shows what they are trending towards and what they could be, very well be in the future. Um, so what we found is they've been pretty spot on in their prediction in terms of inflation, which is a hot topic right now. We all know that. Um, but especially in the, in the funeral industry, um, it's trending upwards uh, pretty quickly. And so we want to hedge against that inflation, want to protect your family from that um, tough financial conversation when that occurs. And our, the way that we do that is what we use what's called a funeral policy. Um, so you may have heard of a funeral policy before. You may have heard of you know, bank trust that the funeral home will use. So our, our policies do five key things. The first thing it does is it locks in the current cost. So it prevents against that inflation. Uh, our funds are protected by our insurance provider to make sure that just in case we go out of business, which we're not going to, but just in case, or if our building burns down, you know, worst case scenario stuff, um, that that is transferable to any other mortuary um, in the country. 
Uh, we also understand people will move out of the area later in life. So we totally um, uh, have a, a, a flexible product to make sure that you can move it with you and that money is never lost. They also offer manageable monthly payment plans to give you protection during the payment period. So just in case you pass away early and your payments aren't done, the payments would stop and the entire thing, the entire funeral or cremation service is covered by the insurance company. The reason we set it up like this is we want to make sure that at any moment, your loved ones are not left with that financial burden, that, that tough conversation, right? Because we see that every day, people, you know, uh, doing GoFundMes, uh, you name it. So we really want to prevent that uh, family having to go through that. And then the other add-on we, we add to any burial or cremation plan, we call it out of area protections provided to us through a company called Sepio Guard. Um, and what it does is make sure if you were to pass away anywhere in the world outside of 75 miles from here, they would take care of the cost and logistics of bringing you back into our care. So make sure you have that peace of mind we've been talking about, home and away. Uh, so it's a lifetime membership. You get a little membership card that goes in your wallet. It's worldwide coverage, uh, as I said. Uh, no age questions, health questions, or deductibles. It's just a one-time cost, and you're good for life. So we'll definitely be going over that with you when we meet individually. But uh, it's a hugely valuable uh, add-on to any pre-plans um, for anybody who's not only like traveling internationally, but just visiting family down in LA for the weekend. I mean, that could be a huge burden getting somebody back up uh, here from there. So it is a, a huge help to a lot of families having that in place. And then a, a fairly new program for us uh, that we provide to all of our families. There may be a little bit of overlap with the stuff that Little and Kennedy provide. So definitely go to them for all those needs. But uh, this kind of helps with, um, you know, any, any logistical support that the family needs at that time. So it's an online resource that we provide to all of our families. Uh, it helps to close out accounts. Um, it uh, helps you to make sure you, you got credit cards closed out. Um, you know, how do I get my last social security payment? Things like that, that, you know, especially if you're not prepared for this stuff, right? These are questions that are commonly asked. So we make sure to send that out to all of our families, their next of kin, making sure that they get every uh, base covered. And then along with that, they provide some online grief support resources, online courses on grief support, as well as being able to ask uh, a, ther a certified th grief therapist um, questions like, how do I talk to my kids about, um, about death? I wasn't able to properly grieve because of COVID. Um, you know, uh, it's been a year since since the passing of, of my husband. Um, how do I best deal with this with this grief? So, um, you name it, they've got all kinds of video responses to those kinds of questions. So to kind of finish up here, I just want to sum up some common reasons why people pre-plan their funerals. Um, decisions that would burden the family members later are handled now. The peace of mind it gives to you and your loved ones. Uh, we've been talking about that a bit about that this whole time. No doubts about what the funeral or final disposition should include. We don't want any cases where, um, you know, a, a son heard you say burial early in life and then daughter hears uh, cremation later in life. If nothing's written down ahead of time, there might be some conflict on that day. We would definitely want to prevent that as well. So allowing loved ones to have a positive grieving experience. And then finally, ensuring that funeral costs are addressed, oftentimes leaving nothing for the family to worry about. So that's kind of, to sum up our, our presentation here today. And uh, we have Mercedes and Cindy here to answer any questions as well as myself. This is their contact info. We will be sending, or I guess uh, Maggie will be sending out uh, all of our contact info for any further questions you have um, after the presentation. Absolutely. Uh, Although we're going to try to answer everyone's questions today. So yes, <laughs> sounds good. All I'll right. go and, mute and you let me know what questions uh, folks have. Oh. I've got a whole bunch of questions, but if anybody is watching, um, sorry about the technical difficulties with the chat. Uh, hopefully you all shouted out the right answers, but um, so our chat is not working. We're not sure why, but you can still ask your questions in the Q&A. Uh, so make sure you ask your questions. Like I said, we had a couple of questions. Some of my questions were answered, but first of all, I would just like to comment and say, I cannot believe that the, the Memorial Park has been around for over 130 years. I just, that blew that just blew me away. I had absolutely no idea. And I've lived here my entire life. I mean, and this is what I work on, right? So that's pretty exciting. Okay. Um, you answered some of my questions. Okay. So I always make this joke. You know, they're, the clients are coming in, they're working on their trust. They're obviously thinking about, 
their end of life stuff. And so I always ask them, this is a really great time for you to start thinking about if you haven't already your burial or cremation plans. Have you thought about it? If you haven't, this is a great time to do that. And I always make the joke, it's a lot more cost effective for you to do it today than it is when you pass away because then you've got this body. What are we going to do with this? Um, but is that true? Does the cost, because it, it sounds sort of like you've locked in this price and over time the inflation is going to go up. So it's not just really about we have this body. It's really about you've lived another 20 years and just it goes up. Am I right about that? Are my jokes on point here? You're definitely right about that. I, I'm i a prime example of what I bought my spot when I first started working at the park in 1999 and the cost has gone up five times what I paid. Wow. And plus the location, you know, when we open a garden, you have first choice of any location, which is really nice. And then that fills up and then, you know, we have to open a new area and pretty soon it will be full, you know, eventually. That's what I'm telling and then you we also guys, time to plan. Many times you we offer savings too when people pre-plan, say 10% off of what the normal cost would be and also financing terms. And that helps too, because, you know, sometimes people can't come up with that large amount of money at once. So it does afford um, the ability to make um, monthly payments, which payments is nice. over time. Okay. That's yeah, great. exactly. So you, Cindy, you bring up a good point. Is there a cost differential between having a burial space and then being cremated? Well, the cost difference, yeah, would be for the cemetery and also the funeral home, as Mercedes knows. And maybe she could touch on the difference in cost for that. Okay. Because I got a couple of cost questions, which I know it's kind of weird, but everyone wants to know, right? I'm where I'm trying to be cost effective, but also I want to follow my wishes. Right, absolutely. So um, with cremation and burial, it just depends the type of celebration and memorialization that your family is going to want to have that depends on the price. So, you know, people think, oh, it's cremation, it's a lot cheaper. Well, not necessarily because you can have a cremation that's really, you know, you go all out and um, it's about the same as a burial, uh, as well as the, the plot that you purchase for your urn, you know, it can also be, um, you know, not necessarily less expensive because it's cremation. Yeah. So it depends on what kind of party and whether you're going to be placed somewhere and not just yeah. tossed out the garbage or something. Right. That's, I always hear this when I get these questions. It's like, well, I don't really care. Like, I just want to be cremated and then do whatever you want with me. But do you really find that's the case? Like when people are coming in and talking to you, that they really do have a preference more often than not? I think people, when they just, when they're talking to themselves, they say that to themselves, but when they talk to their family, that's not the case. It's, it's more involved and it's not really about them anymore. Yeah. They don't care. They're not here anymore. It's other people to deal with it. Right. So, yeah. Right. It's not about you, right? It's right. about us <laughs> and us. What are we going to do? Um, all right. I have a couple of other questions. Um, what does a funeral director do? What's their job in all of this? Who wants to answer that? I know you guys are looking at each other like, who's going to do it? <laughs> Mercedes, you got that one or, or you want me to say go? Okay. <laughs> um, so a funeral director is somebody who's dedicated to the family on that day, right? So they're there to guide them through the entire process from, you know, when we get that first call of funeral home um, and then planning whatever service, how, however simple or complicated they want. Um, the funeral job, the funeral director's job is to kind of be there for that family through that entire process until the body is uh, interred or cremated, ashes scattered, whatever it might be. So it's kind of like you're... Um, consultant at the funeral home uh, through that whole process. Um, so, you know, by pre-planning, uh, we make their jobs a lot easier as well as your family. So we at the funeral home love when people pre-plan because we'd much rather start, you know, with everything planned out rather than a family full of nine kids come in and they're starting from square one because, you know, the mom or dad just passed away. And, um, you know, we're human beings too. We get emotional. It's, it's tough. So it, it helps everybody involved. That's the point. Right. And it's less expensive. So I point that out. Um, okay. So I think that a good question for the family too is what do they do? Like they say they find this folder in their estate planning folder, you know, do they just call you guys and you're just going to walk them through everything then? 
Um, we had a client who had, you know, their friend passed away and the body just sort of sat at the hospital in the morgue because they just assumed that somebody was going to take care of it for them, right? So who who does the family member call first? Who should be the point of contact? If someone passes away in, at home or if you're ever around someone that passes away, you call 911 and they send the fire department, police department, or, and possibly, co and coroner actually, and then the coroner decides, you know, what needs to be, if the deceased person would need to be taken to the funeral home. And in that case, the family would call the funeral home if they have one in their paperwork. Otherwise they'd have to, you know, locate one. And then um, the funeral home would pick their loved one up at their residence or the hospital. But I would think the hospital would reach out to the next of kin because I don't think that they would want someone there too long sitting there but right? sometimes they might not be able to locate the next of kin that could be a problem too see this is why it's so important everyone sitting out there to make sure you plan for all of this so that you're not just sitting at the hospital in the morgue all That's by yourself it. um what's the difference between like a memorial service and a funeral is there a difference i'm sorry did you get that one Go ahead, Mike. Oh, um, well, generally, uh, memorial service uh, usually means there's uh, not a casket present, um, and then funeral uh, means that there is one. Um, you know, some people call a memorial with an urn present, uh, you know, so some remains present. Um, so I've heard it used either way, but that's generally the, the difference there. And so that's different from like a viewing or a wake then, too. See, I'm getting you guys all into these fun little nuances. Good question. Yeah. Um, so awake, uh, typically, uh, again, I've heard these terms thrown around different ways, but what we typically see is uh, an open casket uh, where the family can come visit with you, um, you know, see you one last time. Um, I like to use the example of when we experience a national tragedy, uh, everybody turns on the TV, right? Because we need to see things to make it real. So having a viewing or visitation or awake um, can be a pretty impactful experience for, for us. So kind of like a closure or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So I know Mercedes is sort of answering this, but how do you plan for a funeral here but maybe you want the remains cremated and placed somewhere else, right? You want them their ashes spread in Hawaii because that sounds fun and exotic, I don't know. Can you guys do that? I'm assuming you can. Yes, you can. You definitely can um, arrange for that. Um, that's, um, you know, I talk to families more often than not that leave that specified in their uh, final wishes organizer to um, have their ashes scattered, you know, off the coast of Monterey or, you know, Hawaii. So we'll um, prepare a uh, disposition permit that states where these cremated remains will be scattered. And um, we work with different services that allow that to, to happen. And in some cases, some family can be present. Um, so there's different ways of doing it, or, you know, they can take the remains and do it themselves and then provide the family with the certificate with the coordinates where they were uh, scattered. So it's really interesting. That brings me to, that is my next point. Do you remember a while ago, this probably comes up all the time. There was that storage unit where they found like 50,000 remains in the storage unit. So you guys are going to make sure that that doesn't happen to my family member, right? Okay. Yes. <laughs> I'll be glad to say that when that when that happened, the state of California put uh, in place a Department of Consumer Affairs, and they monitor the cemetery and funeral home business because of that particular incident. So it's, uh, it's unfortunate that that happened. That was really terrible. But they have sort of stepped in to monitor everything now. That's how laws are made when bad people do bad things, right? That's right. Okay. Um, what are some examples of, of personalizing your funeral service what do what do you what do people most often do or is it just sort of all over the map uh, what i've witnessed is that everyone's really unique and that's the nice thing about a funeral or a celebration of life that everyone is unique and everyone makes it their own and there's families from um just different backgrounds and different um customs and different just faiths that do what they want to honor their loved one so that's you know, there is, it's not one size fits all or just one thing. This is all we do. It's basically open to anything. All right. I like it. 
<laughs> and you're more <laughs> likely to get that personalization if you plan in advance. Absolutely, yes. Yes, that's a thing uh, yeah, you get to I say. <laughs> I had another point I wanted to get back yeah. to on our, our last question. They had asked about transporting cremated remains, and I think we covered scattering uh, cremated remains, uh, but certainly you could send your remains to a cemetery across the country. It doesn't necessarily have to be Los Cajos Memorial Park, right? Um, cool. But we hope it is. Uh, yeah, good point. Send ashes to different family members. If you've got children scattered across the country and you want to um, send them a little bit of ashes, uh, certainly people do that all the time. Um, Shipping the ashes happens through the Postal Service, U.S. Postal Service, which we always cross our fingers. Uh, they do a great job usually, uh, but it's always <laughs> best for uh, your loved ones to carry that uh, urn in their carry-on uh, if they're getting on a plane, making sure it's a, it's a wood urn. We typically recommend that because otherwise if it's metal, they might have to make you check that or they might search it or might come up on oh. the scan, you know, like you can imagine how All bad of these could... things you never really thought about until this point in time. So just wanted to cover uh, that's how it could happen, um, you know, if, if needed. Do you have to have a permit to carry the remains on the airplane, like on your carry-on or anything like that? Yeah. You can't just we, like stick them in your pocket and <laughs> go across. We give you all the proper permits to carry with you. Absolutely. And don't scatter them at Disneyland. I've heard that all the time, right? Um, let's see. I have other questions. So everyone else has questions too. I mean, I'm don't forget to ask, this is your chance to ask all of your questions, everybody. Um, okay, this question comes up all the time, right? I've created my trust in California. And for some reason, I've decided to leave the great state of California and I'm not coming back. Can I transfer my plan out of the state? Yes, the funeral policy is transferable to another funeral home if you ended up moving from the state. Yes. Yeah, see, I know you were sitting there in stunned silence because you were thinking, why would you move out of the state of California? <laughs> why would you do that? So you can move it. And we just learned you can transfer the body to any place in the country too. So you're not stuck here in California if you don't want to be. I didn't even think about that. Um, and you help, I, you said earlier, you help with the military uh, burials and it helps to have the paperwork, which I remind everyone because that is always the hardest part. And some of the veterans, you may not know this, but a lot of, for example, combat veterans, they get a, they get a one-time like final death payment, which helps cover some funeral costs if you haven't already planned for it, which you guys are all gonna plan for it at this point, right? Um, do most people, if they buy a burial plot, do they put it in their trust? You guys are all looking at me. You can buy it in the trust. I know that. Two people? I've had some people transfer it into their trust. Yeah. Not too many, but a few. Depends on how expensive your plot is, right? If you buy the mausoleum at the top of the hill, it's probably more expensive. Right? I'm not Does sure what know? protection you get. From, there must be some protection from just having all your assets together. Maybe it's not real property, such as real estate. It's an interment right. So, but people do put it in their trust sometimes. Can you transfer a burial plot once you've purchased it? Like if I say over time, as you said, the it's it was cremation and then it's burial and now we're sort of back to cremation. I've decided I don't want my burial plot, but maybe somebody in my family does or I want to sell it. Can I do that? Yes, you can. We have a quick claim uh, deed that we process in the office when someone transfers their plot. You can also move your location from... Maybe like you said, you change from cremation to casket so you can move your location also. And so, and then even husband and wife, if the husband says he wants a casket burial and the wife says, well, I want cremation, you can still have an urn and a spot and a casket in the same burial plot. They're not going to agree. It depends on who dies yeah, first, oh, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> depends who dies first. Um, what happens if I die before I paid all of my uh, funeral uh, plans? I think there's an answer from no, and there's an answer from the cemetery. So Mercedes, take it away, sorry. <laughs> sorry, uh, yes, so that's uh, the benefit of pre-planning, uh, having your plan and um, if you're on payments, the policy uh, will pay the funeral. Um, the, the payments would stop and then the, the policy would, uh, the insurance would pay. That's nice. So it's kind of like having, yeah, like an insurance plan. You've, right. you've planned for that in advance. 
Um, let's see, I've asked that question. I'm running out of questions, everybody. Um, what if I change my mind? Can I cancel the contract then? I'm assuming I don't get any money back, but can I just say, you know what? I, I don't wanna do it anymore. I refuse, I'm never gonna die. No one's ever said that to me, but you never know. <laughs> Yeah, I imagine a hundred percent of people who pre-plan, you know, we have a hundred percent death rate so far, right? So, so eventually, far. yeah, eventually you're going to need it. So, like most people who cancel this need the money back. That's the only reason to really do that. If you need to transfer it to another funeral home, another provider, you can absolutely do that, at least on the funeral home side. And so, it is flexible in that way. Um, you technically have 30 days to do that with no penalty after you start uh, the policy with us. Um, but if you ever need to be on that, there is uh, a small, what we call surrender policy cost. Okay. Um, what is embalming? Do we have to do an embalming when somebody dies? I'm getting into all the nitty gritty stuff now. Nobody wants to answer that, the question about embalming. It's okay, I get it. You got it. <laughs> You want to go? You want to take this one? She said <laughs> no. <laughs> so Mike moment, knows how I feel about about talking about when a death occurs. It's kind of different as you know when you talk about it before. <laughs> so I like. All right. So Michael's going to talk to us about what happens when someone dies. What then? What happens? I guess we need a bigger answer to this question. Is everyone wants to know what happens after someone dies? <laughs> well, I won't get too too detailed into. Um, I'll tell you all you need to know, right? So okay. um, embalming doesn't need to happen for everybody who passes away. Um, so what that, it actually started during the Civil War uh, when people need to transport their loved ones back from the battlefield uh, so they could see them. Um, so embalming's been around a long time and we use it to preserve a body outside of refrigeration. Um, and so the reason we do that is for open casket uh, viewings like a wake, like I was saying, uh, for, you know, if the casket's gonna be, gonna be open for a while, wanna make sure that body's safe for everybody to be in there with, their, with the body. Um, and then also for long distance transport. So if we're putting that body on an airplane, if you've got the out of area protection, you're on vacation off the coast of Italy on a cruise, we want to make sure that, you know, that body is preserved and able to make the trip all the way back here so we can do your service. Um, so they would do embalming out there. Yeah. I think, I think you hit the nail on the head though, is that pre-planning allows us to continue living our lives because no matter where we are, you guys are going to take care of us and get us home. That's, exactly. I think that's the key of, of that story. Um, speaking of what happens after we die, can we, can we plan or can our family plan to have us wear something specific to have us buried with anything? Are there restrictions on, you know, what if I have a cultural custom or something like that? Is that allowed to be followed, um, after somebody passes away? Yeah, a lot of different uh, religions have different customs. And so we are um, aware of most of those, you know, because we've helped families for so many years. Um, but you can have things in your casket. You can write letters to your loved one. You can, the only thing we don't permit are pet burials at the cemetery. What? But they're, no pets. They're like our family. I know it's it's really unfortunate. I don't really understand why it would be kind of nice because a lot of people do have their mm. pets cremated remains at home. Um, but there are pet cemeteries, the closest one to Napa it would be nice if there were one closer, but there's a restriction with that. Huh. I didn't I was just gonna ask if there was a pet cemetery too. So. <laughs> well, that's sad. Um, we have another question. Can a family member be present during the cremation? We do have the crematory uh, that is located on the grounds of the Los Gatos Memorial Park. The mm -hmm. funeral home, the Darling Fisher funeral homes take care of everything affiliated with the body and then they schedule the cremation. There's something called a witness cremation where families do gather. Uh, it's a cultural, um, cultural type of service typically and the family can go, a few members can go into the crematory when the body is placed in and, and then sometimes even go so far as to push the cremation button that's just a tradition some some cultures have so interesting you can be there yeah what about the alternative stuff um people are even getting more alternative than the cre cremation like 
I don't know, you want to be buried like under a tree or something like that. Are you guys doing any of that sort of new age alternative stuff? I don't know if it's alternative now, but like we're not quite there yet. The cemetery isn't just because I think it might take up a little bit more land when you have a green burial, they call it, without a vault or a casket. You know, I don't know. I think there are some places maybe in Marin County that do that, but where we, um, because we're so small and we don't have a lot of land, we have every, every casket goes into a vault. So everything's mapped, you know, inch by inch pretty much at the cemetery. Well, we do live in uh, Silicon Valley. So it, real estate mm -hmm. here is very valuable and yeah. you do have to use every spot. Okay, I have another question. Um, do you have sort of celebration of life packages or other packages with structure already laid out for people who just don't know where to start. Like, I know I need to do it. It's been on my to-do list, just like having a trust. And now what? Where where do I even begin with all of this? We do actually at Jolene and Fisher, we have um, packages already put together for different uh, celebration of life, memorialization, um, cremation, witness cremation, uh, if different faiths. Um, the ritual washings, things like that, that it's a package that's already put together. So families don't, you know, have to think of every detail. We've already kind of put something together and you can either take something out or add something. It's just something that we provide families with to give them an understanding of what can happen at a funeral. All right. Different, different levels of packages. Yes. <laughs> okay. Like the gold star, I don't know, bronze or something like that. Um, what if, what if I plan for my burial? Like I've picked my casket, like I'm all ready to go. And 20 years from now, my, my views are changing over time or something like that. Or I've planned for the burial, but I told my family members I've changed my mind and have been cremated. Are you going to follow what I've put in paper? Or are you going to follow what the wishes are that I've told my family? There's like now a debate, right? Who, who who's more correct here? So when you pre-plan, there is an option where you state that the family is able to change those arrangements or the family is not. Ooh. <laughs> so <laughs> nice. So you could control from beyond the grave. That's absolutely. Great. Yes. That's the, I don't know any clients who are like that at all. None whatsoever. So I'm shocked <laughs> that that would not be an option. Um, Oh, I had that made me think of something, but now I can't remember. Can I have a live band play at my memorial or funeral or something like that? We've had bands at the cemetery. Uh, usually we would want them earlier in the day because we do we are located in a neighborhood, so we don't want to disturb the neighbors too much either. But probably Mercedes at the funeral home, would that be more appropriate, do you think? Yes, we have seen that at the funeral home as well. Mm -hmm. You don't want the bagpipes out there at like five o'clock when the sun's <laughs> going down sort of a thing? Bagpipes are nice. Some, you know, 20 piece bands might be a little bit loud. The mariachi. So we've had them. I would yes. do that for sure. I mean, make it a party. It's nice though. Mm -hmm. like, I guess it depends on your view of everything, right? Is it a party? Mm -hmm. um, oh, here's a good one. If I provide my own casket, does Darling Fisher charge an additional fee? Is it like a BYOB, BYOC? right? Uh, sometimes that happens when you go out to eat, right? If I bring my own wine, you're going to have a cork fee. Is that the same way if I maybe gotten my casket on Amazon? I think they do that now, by the way. Yeah. So we have families who um, opt for that and we don't guarantee it. So if it's shipped to us and it's broken, we don't, we, we you're can't. not going to fix it for us, Mercedes. Not really? <laughs> Does that mean they have to buy a new one then because it was shipped wrong or do you send, you know, they have to send it back? Um, you, well, I'm not too sure. Honestly, I haven't experienced it. My okay. year here, I haven't seen anyone go through that, but it is my, you know, we do tell them, you know, this is what you're purchasing that you're, we're guaranteeing the, the product. Yeah, it's just such an important thing to make sure it gets there in one piece. And so our casket suppliers are obviously experts in shipping caskets. They'll overnight it every time to make sure it's there on time. Um, but you have like a Costco or Amazon deliver it. Um, it may not get there on time. There may be like issues that might be broken. And if the funeral is the next day, there's 
you know, we might have to reschedule, like people might have flown in from out of the area, like it, it messes things up, obviously. So we don't recommend it. Uh, it could happen. If you've built your own casket, that's great. Um, you know, that's certainly possible. But it's just it's the family's responsibility to get there in one piece. Okay. So speaking of caskets, can we just stay on this topic for a second? Now I'm fascinated. Um, you can customize, I'm assuming, your casket to your wishes, or you can have your family do that um, when you're planning all of this fun stuff. I meant uh, somebody who is well versed in woodworking or something can build their own like no no I know that but when you're there and you're going through your packages or whatever you've decided you can pick from a different caskets it's not just like a that's a one size fits all casket sort of a thing like there's different varieties and colors I'm assuming you guys offer for sure okay. all right answered that question um is darling fisher associated with dignity memorial No, that's the answer to that question. Okay. You don't do any sort of like, um, let's see, did I answer that question? Like Viking burials by chance, do you? Nothing, you don't have like a pond where we can just, no. We don't have that, but I did have someone bury, uh, laid his mom to rest in a NASCAR casket because she was a NASCAR fan. So there are specialty caskets you can order. I had someone uh, bury someone in a Prince casket because they liked Prince. So this kind of makes it personal. And... You can do personalizations. Then. Yes. Wow. Oh, that makes Very up for the fact that we can't have our dogs and cats with us. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the bury at sea is um, not super popular, but it is an option. Um, you can bur bury a body at sea. Um, there's a, there's a, a vessel in Santa Cruz um, and they, it's like a 12 hour voyage because they got to go way out of the area and then they, they drop you down and then you're buried at sea. So that is possible. But no fire and nothing like that. I don't Not think that that's a ceremony. I, I suppose it's possible. They don't actually recommend the family comes with them on that voyage. It's a long day. Um, oh, wow. So. I don't, yeah, I get seasick. So that's, I'm, I'm officially out of questions. Is there anything else you want everyone to know before we're done today? Any other questions? This is your chance to ask three experts in that post-death planning. I Oh, I thought of another question. Um, once everyone's passed away, right here we are, the family's there. Do you need to have the healthcare directive, the advanced directive with them to say this person has the authority to make these decisions? You know, what if there's a dispute among family members who's making the final decision? Does that ever happen? So Did typically, uh, like, yeah. if everything's pre-planned out, your family won't have to make many decisions uh, or very any at all, really. That's the whole idea. Um, if nothing's pre-planned, nothing's signed ahead of time, then typically it's up to the next of kin um, to be responsible for that. With cremation, you may have to have multiple next of kins or family members sign off on that. Um, and so all the more reason to have you sign it ahead of time because um, tracking those people down sometimes is, is difficult to authorize that. Um, do you need Neptune Society or something else, or is that something you guys can do, that cremation all as part of your services? Mm, no, we have our own crematory, which um, uh, Cindy shared that it's located at Los Gatos Memorial Park. So Jolene and Fisher owns its own crematory that's at Los Gatos Memorial, and we have control over um, the scheduling and just, you know, your loved one is always with us under our care. Um, so no, we wouldn't need that. With Darlene good. Fisher. Mm -hmm. And that makes sure again that they're not going to end up in a storage unit. Just right. what I'm saying, right? It all stays on site I like that. So it sounds like there's a whole bunch of flexibility and the ability to make all of these really fun decisions. Um, is it like something that people should revisit every couple of years? I you know I always tell everyone, you know, you establish your trust, it's revocable. So every couple of years, big life changes come in and view it. Do you have people that just come in you know, every couple of years and update their plan? Probably not really for the funeral home, but maybe more at the cemetery because sometimes people might, um, maybe their, their mom passed away and the son or daughter says, I'm going to buy a plot next to mom or dad and they buy their plot. And then maybe 10 years later, they think, oh, I wonder if I took care of everything. So they might come by the cemetery and we'll review their file and say, oh, you know, there are these other costs for the opening and closing and the vault or the headstone, whatever else. So it's always good to review your uh, policy, mainly at the cemetery, but I think the funeral home uh, or, or the um, that policy might not be to 
need to be reviewed. What do you think, Mercedes? Well, I'll tell you what, when I made my um, arrangements, I never want to think about it again. I thought about it, I did it, and it's not something I want to fantasize about anymore. So <laughs> I think that people, when they do the funeral part of it, it's kind of like, all right, I got this done. That, that's it. I don't really want to think about it anymore. Um, but I, I haven't um, had anyone really come in to say, you know, some people just want to verify and make sure that they still have it because it's been you know, 10 years and do I still have it? Yes, it's still here. You'll, you'll have it for life <laughs> until you need it. So still protected. Yes, yes. All right, good, excellent. All right, I don't have any other questions. I don't see any other questions. Any other last comments or thoughts from any of you, Michael, Cindy, Mercedes? No? Just thank you so much. I think the hardest part about this whole process is like coming on a webinar to talk to funeral people, you know, like there's, it's taboo, right? So you've taken a big step and the easiest thing not to do now is to kind of let it fall by the wayside. So we definitely recommend meeting with Cindy Mercedes uh, to get, at least start that process. They'll get you all the information you need that's tailored to you specifically so that uh, your loved ones don't have to. Absolutely. Um, I just want to thank you guys for all being here because again, it is a very uncomfortable conversation. I understand talking about death is not fun or exciting in any way. Um, although it's very interesting as I found out today. So I appreciate you guys answering all of my questions. Um, and for everyone here and everyone listening, uh, we will send out an email with all of the contact information. So if you do say it's time, I'm ready. Uh, you know, you, I've lit that, right? I'm ready to go. Uh, you can talk, contact anybody. And at a minimum, sign up for our newsletter. Um, that way you can get all of our updated information. Um, and that's it. So I hope everyone really has a great weekend. Again, thank you for joining us today.